Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Atkinson, and I'm the executive director of the Johnson Sayama Graduate School of Public Policy. Today, <laughs> see, I I paid him for I paid his parking and this. Um, today's event, the uh, the speaker today's um, for today is uh, the managing director of the Asian Development Bank, Rajat uh, Nagan. He is going to be introduced in a in a moment, but I I do want to point out to you that today's program is really brought to you by a host of different people. It shows that we really are genuine partners. The Canadian International Council and Dan Sutherland is here representing the, the National Conversation on Asia and the Asia Pacific Foundation with whom the school and indeed the university uh, has had uh, uh, recent uh, intensive uh, relationships and, uh, and it's through their good offices that we're able to, uh, to have our speaker here today. So we have uh, a number, and of course the School of Public Policy, only too happy to plug ourselves, right? Uh, I'm going to first of all ask Douglas Gould from the Asia Pacific Foundation to come up and say a few words about the national conversation on Asia. Then Dan Sutherland, the man up here who's been clapping, will introduce our guest, uh, and then we'll be underway. So, Doug, over to you. Thanks very much, Michael. And I'm the Toronto content. I'm, uh, I run the Toronto office of the uh, Asia Pacific Foundation. So yesterday we won the Great Cup, and today we lost our mayor. As you may have noticed, Mayor Ford has been uh, told to resign by a court order for conflict of interest. And I can tell you on the ground that there's been one, he's been involved in one scandal after another, and he just uh, was forced out by a court order a couple of hours ago. So that's a huge surprise, which has turned the whole city into turmoil. And then the other thing on my BlackBerry, I was just about to uh, email uh, a friend from another NGO, Canada 2020. Her name is Diana Carney. And I was looking at the TV set. We were just at Cameco. And it said, Mark Carney goes to Bank of Canada, and that's her husband. So maybe that meeting's off and she's moving to London. So there's been a lot going on today. <laughs> We're delighted to have uh, Mr. Nag here. Uh, he's only going to two Canadian cities. He's specifically asked to be here in Saskatoon. As you will soon find out, he has a, a degree from the university. And we met with the president this morning, and he's wearing uh, cufflinks from the university. <laughs> meeting here, it's, meeting I'm in... Toronto, and I would also tell you, you know, I'm, I know the opinion of some people in this part of the country towards Toronto. This is the third time I've been here already. I'm on the point of moving, and I love the province. I think it's fantastic. And the, the event we had here, I'm being honest, we've done events for the National Conversation in eight provinces, and I think the one in March we did uh, with Michael Atkinson was probably the single most successful thing we've done, and it's great to see a province with such a good uh, attitude and uh, a great future and seems to be doing well while the rest of the world's not doing so well. So just quickly on the national conversation in Asia, what we're basically trying to do is to get Canadians to think and talk about Asia and what its rise, which is an accomplished fact, means for Canadians and how we have to think in policy terms and public terms about how we manage that rise to ensure that we have provincial policies and federal policies that fit for a more Asia-centric uh, century, the 21st century. And with that, I'm turning it over to Dan uh, of the CIC, the local branch, and uh, I used to be involved with them as well. So Dan, over to you. Thanks so much. Wow. First of all, thank you, all of you, for showing up. It's really nice to have a really strong, uh, a strong audience so we can have the conversation here. Um, and we, what a conversation we have available for us today. Concerning our speaker, as, as you've heard, he's a graduate of the U of S, having earned his BCom and his MBA from here. Mr. Rajat Nag has been with the Asian Development Bank for more than two decades, and he's assumed his current position of Managing Director General in December 2006, which means you have your sixth anniversary coming up. Happy anniversary. I, I want to get these comments right because I think it's very important. With broad experience across Asia, he provides a critical role of, with the Asian Development Bank's strategic and operational direction to achieve its mission of helping developing member countries reduce poverty and improve the quality of life of their people. He also oversees the organization's risk management operations. Here to present to us on Asia's challenges, ensuring inclusive and green growth. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Rajat Nath. Thank, 
Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, I'm very impressed with the number of partners uh, that you have brought together. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks to Asia Pacific Foundation and the Johnson Shamoya Graduate School of Public Policy and the other partners, uh, the Edwards School of Business, the Canadian International Council, the New Saskatchewan International Office, all of you here to, to be here. First of all, here are my couplings. This is University of Saskatchewan couplings. They are, they are now collector's item, 40 years old, and I'm told they're not available anymore. So I showed them to your president today, and she was also duly impressed. Of course, you notice that I use them sparingly. That's why they're in this good shape still. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for, for inviting me. Uh, but before I start, uh, I would like to take this opportunity of acknowledging the presence of two of my gurus here. And uh, the reason that I'm here today is because of the two of them. Professor Gupta, who, <laughs> who, who brought me here uh, 43 years back. Uh, I didn't know him, he didn't know me, so, you know, it was just my good fortune that he picked me as his graduate student and I came. And Professor Sarkar, uh, all of you know him uh, of the School of Business. It wasn't called the Edward School of Business, uh, but I did my MBA under him and both of them have been my mentors, my philosophers, my guides and my friends for that longer period. I'm most grateful for all the 43 years and for being here. Thank you. Uh, when the, is the volume a bit too high? I should probably just put it down a bit. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, when the Asia Pacific Foundation uh, kindly invited me uh, to talk about this topic, I thought uh, it's a very appropriate one to talk about these two issues, inclusive growth and green growth in the context of Asia. But I'd like to expand that a bit. Uh, I'll talk about not only Asia's challenges, but how the rest of the world, say particularly Canada, can deal with it. So I think there will be, there'll be some convergence uh, of, of interest. Uh, let me start by uh, saying that uh, the Asian story uh, is a success story uh, over the last 40, 45 years. I think Asia has seen what would be tantamount to a transformation. Uh, 1970, uh, one in every two Asian uh, lived on less than dollar a day, which is the international poverty standard. By 1990, uh, that level had gone down to one in every three. And by 2005, it had gone down to one in every five less than that, 19% actually. Uh, this is a huge transformation in a generation. Uh, of course, uh, principally fueled by China uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, India in the 90s, Vietnam, Indonesia, and other countries throughout that period. But over this 40 year period, uh, there's been a huge transformation in Asia. And I think it's uh, right to say that Asians today are richer, uh, healthier uh, and more educated than they were a generation back. This uh, success story uh, obviously uh, leads one to be a bit euphoric uh, and uh, human nature being what it is uh, leads one to extrapolate the past and say that will what will happen in the future. So you extrapolate the 10% growth rates that China has seen or eight, nine percent India has seen and you say this is how it's going to be and it has led therefore to a term which I'm sure many of you have heard that this is the Asian century. I've always had problems with that term uh, and in the ADB we thought it will be good to test it out because you can't just extrapolate the past into the future, it will be too simple. Uh, so last year we undertook a fairly significant study uh, called Asia 2050. It basically sets out what could be some possible scenarios going out to the middle of the century. And it would be naturally very 
foolish of us to have tried to make projections. So we didn't, but we did have, we have two scenarios and we talked about what would it take for scenario A or scenario B to unfold and then of course have a debate going. So my, my presentation today is a part of that debate, part of that discourse. Uh, I'm not saying that will happen. I'm saying this could happen if this, this happens. So, our basic conclusion is that the so-called Asian century is certainly possible, but it is not preordained. And I'll build on that thesis for the next uh, 45 minutes. Uh, we set out two possible scenarios. The first scenario, we call it uh, the Asian century scenario. It's a scenario of an affluent Asia in which basically what has happened in the recent past with some changes will continue. It's a scenario in which Asia will produce over half of the world's global GDP by 2050. Now it's about 27 percent. Uh, it will produce about 52 percent of the global GDP by 2050 under this scenario. Uh, per capita incomes would increase to $40,000 a year. and. Uh, an average Asian in 2050 would enjoy a standard of living comparable to Europeans today. And in this process, 3 billion people, which is more than the population of China and India together, would have moved out of poverty, would have sort of got a certain amount of affluence. Now, this is an extremely uh, positive, uh, not impossible but certainly not preordained. And I keep repeating it because in Asia and perhaps here as well, when you hear about Asia, everybody thinks that's it, we've made it. And I think our point is not yet. The alternate scenario, uh, which is also possible, is not quite so rosy. And it proposes that unless we take some very fundamental steps, and I'll go through them in a moment, uh, we could in Asia, slip into what is called the middle income trap. And the middle income trap is basically a scenario in which, just as a trap, you can't compete with countries above you because they're technologically more advanced and they're more innovative and you haven't sort of been able to catch up with their skills. And you can't compete with countries below you and make shoes and garments because your wage rates have gone up. You're caught. You can't sort of compete with people above, you can't compete with people below, and you sort of somehow plateau out. And it's not a far-fetched situation because the world is full of such examples. Brazil is a classic case. Uh, Brazil in 1967, mid-60s, had a per capita income greater than that of Korea. By 1990, Korea had become, uh, 1992 to be precise, had become an OECD country and Brazil sort of still sort of languished. Uh, the country I live in now, Philippines, is another classic case. In 1960s, Philippines was supposed to be the growth story following Japan. Japan number one, Philippines number two. Things have turned out. Otherwise, Philippines has got caught the middle income trap. So if countries in Asia get caught in this scenario of the middle income trap, then uh, our projection is that Asia would account for only 32% of the global GDP instead of 52. And per capita incomes would average only half of that Asian century scenario, not 40, but $20,000. Now, obviously still considerably higher than what it is now, but that's not the point. Point is that it will still be far below the potential that Asia is capable of uh, under the so-called middle income trap scenario. So let me talk about what we believe those challenges are and what Asia has to do to counter those, counter those challenges. I talked about an Asia which is more prosperous, which is healthier, which is more educated than a generation back. And uh, I'm sure many of you have traveled to Asia and you've seen the evidence of that. You see the glitzy towers of Mumbai or Jakarta or Manila or Beijing. But that is only one face of Asia. There is another face of Asia, no less real, but much more stark. And that face of Asia is one in which about 600 million people still don't have access to clean water. 
uh, 1.7, 1.8 billion people don't have access to sanitation. Uh, 20 million children in developing Asia. And whenever I say developing Asia, it means Asia, ex Japan, Australia, New Zealand, just to get the nomenclature right. Uh, 20 million were not enrolled in primary schools. Uh, 3 million children died before the age of 5. And in a way, the most damning of all, 83 million children under the age of 5 are underweight. And the reason I mentioned the statistic, which to me is actually the most serious of all, being underweight at the age of five basically means you're compromised forever, intellectually and physically. Which basically means 83 million people in Asia are already compromised even before they've gone past their fifth birthday. And there's a huge gender inequity in this whole equation. Uh, women are uh, severely disadvantaged. Uh, more girls than boys are out of school in some countries. Uh, more girls than boys will actually never be born in some countries due to prenatal sex addiction and cultural sun preference. So there are some huge issues. So this other face of Asia is just as real. And I think the challenge for us is how to make these two faces converge rather than diverge, which is what's happening at the moment. To do this uh, in Asia, we have to focus on topic that I'm talking about today, inclusive growth. Uh, growth by itself is obviously important, but not good enough. A rising tide lifts all boats is the philosophy behind the growth theory. And that's okay, so long as you can also make the rather heroic assumption that none of the boats have a hole in their hull. Because if they do, then those boats won't rise. As a matter of fact, they'll sink. And that's what happens when people aren't educated or they aren't healthy. They cannot participate in this growth process. They cannot benefit from this growth process. And therefore, they cannot benefit and, and rise with it. So inequality is, is a very critical challenge in Asia. And inequality with growth has actually risen. And uh, between 1990 and late 2010, over this 20 year period, uh, which was, as I said earlier, a very rapid uh, growth period for Asia, it was also a period in which the Gini coefficient increased very significantly. Overall for Asia, the Gini coefficient worsened from 0.39 to 0.46. And as you know, higher the Gini coefficient, more unequal in distribution, income distribution. And individually, countries, almost all countries, excepting for Malaysia and Thailand, the Gini coefficient increased, which means inequality increased. Uh, China went from 0.32 to 0.43. India went from... 0.29, uh, uh, sorry, 0.32 to 0.37. Uh, and Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, any country you take, the Gini coefficient towards it. Now, I think one needs to be concerned about inequality just from an ethical point of view. A society which has this much inequality is not a very stable society with potential of social tension, etc. But even if you leave the ethical portion aside, and I don't think we should, but even if we did, the critical negative about inequality is that it hampers growth. And this is a relatively recent finding. People used to argue against inequality because it's ethically wrong. And I think that's a, that's a fair point. But now we find that inequality hampers growth itself and therefore hampers poverty reduction. And we did some study uh, a couple of years back in which we were actually quite staggered to see that if, for example, in uh, India, the inequality had not risen in the 1990s, but the growth story was exactly the same. So the same growth 
but we held the income distribution as it was, the poverty reduction would have been about 5%. So, the 5 percentage points less poverty. In China, it would again have been about 5 percentage points less. In Indonesia, it would be 6 percentage points less. In Bangladesh, it would have been 10 percentage points less. So, you see, the effect of inequality is even more damaging than we thought. It actually hampers growth. And overall, we estimate that in Asia, developing Asia, an additional 240 million people, that's about six times the population of Canada, would have been lifted out of poverty had, had any income inequality not, not worsened. And I give these numbers because they're very staggering. So let's be worried about inequality because of inequality itself, but because of this effect on on, on, on growth on, on growth and therefore on poverty reduction. So how, how should governments respond to this huge problem? Uh, but before I get to that, I think it's important because I've got into trouble on this point when I've talked about inequality, particularly uh, I think in the Western societies. People have said, but inequality is good. What's wrong with inequality? I mean, you know, I work harder, I I get rewards. I mean, I work harder, I get A. I didn't work hard, I fail. And I think it's, it's a very valid point. But I want to emphasize when I talk about inequality, I'm talking about inequality of access. I'm talking about bad inequality, not inequality of outcome. Sure, you worked hard, you studied for eight hours, you got A. I studied for two hours, I flunked. No problem there. But if I can't get into the university because of my race or my skin or my religion or whatever, most importantly, the circumstances of my birth, that's the inequality I'm talking about. You're born a woman, therefore, you're finished, couple. You're born into a lower caste in India, finished. You're born in country A rather than B, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're talking about inequality of access to on, access to opportunity. So a child who is born and she does not get access to water, that's the inequality I'm talking about. The reason I emphasize this is because I want you to not to say, what did this Mr. Nark say? I mean, what's the problem with inequality? Inequality is good, it makes us strive harder. Now we're talking about the bad inequality. And uh, on the bad inequality, basically governments, society has to then talk about essentially what we call three pillars of inclusive growth. First, of course, is growth itself. I mean, look, there is no question that you need growth. Uh, we're not talking about redistribution. Because then that's sort of just the same pie being cut up in different ways. Particularly in Asia, this is a very, very major issue for growth because even with all this growth that we have had, 500 million people, which is more than 10 times the population of Canada. I keep talking about this 10 times, but just to keep, keep it in perspective, we're talking about some huge numbers here, are unemployed or underemployed. And 15 to 20 million people in Asia join the labor force every year. So we need growth just to stay where we are. So, so please never think that I'm talking about no growth. But I'm talking about a second and a third pillar of growth, which is second pillar is social inclusion. Uh, because you have to have opportunities to go to school, which basically means you have to have access to education. You have to be well. You have to be able to somehow make it past your first and the fifth birthdays to be able to go to school in the first place. So I'm talking about the, the pillar of social inclusion. Uh, you've got to somehow eliminate market and ex institution failures which result in this exclusion. And the third, of course, is having some social safety net so that, you know, you don't fall through it if you are hit with a major catastrophe of illness or a natural disaster or what have you. So these three pillars are extremely critical for what we call inclusive growth. Now, these three pillars must be, of course, supported by good governance and good institutions. And this good governance, I think, is a critical element. And in the panel discussion I had just before this, we talked a bit about it. Good governance is much more than just corruption. 
uh, fighting corruption is a necessary first condition. So, we are not saying that that is not important, but what I am saying is good governance goes beyond corruption. You need competent and honest governments, you need accountability, you need dispute resolution mechanism, you need a rule of law which is implemented. First of all, you need the rule of law. If there is no rule, then of course, nothing. But even if you have that rule of law, you need to have an institutional mechanism, the judiciary, and the capacity to, to implement it. Uh, gender equality. Gender equality obviously must be at the front and center of these three pillars I talked about. Uh, the gender equality and em women's empowerment, again, one could argue and should argue that it's a good in its own right. But even if you go beyond that, not even if you, you must go beyond that and see the huge economic and social consequences of not having gender equity. Now, in this context, I, I find it very useful if I can just take you for a moment to two Sanskrit words which Professor Sain has talked a lot about and I find this very powerful. Uh, very simple Sanskrit word. Uh, first is niti, N-I-T-I. This one I think you should write down. Maybe. And the second Sanskrit word is nyai, N-Y-A-Y-A. Now, both of them in a way mean justice. But there's a very fundamental nuance difference. Niti is about the organizational propriety, the, the rules and the regulations, the behavioral correctness, how you ought to behave. So you need to have niti, you have, a society must have rules. But what happens is, we sometimes get so caught up in niti that we forget ultimately we are after neai. Neai means justice. So you might have all the rules on the book, but if I can't get to the court, and if I can get to the court, I have to wait 20 years for my hearing. I might have had the rules, the niti, but I haven't had nyai. And it doesn't have to be always in context of courts and rules and regulations. A society, a country might have a rule, a law, which talks about universal primary education. Excellent. It's on the books, universal primary education. I was in Nepal in the 90s and in the exuberance of youth and the euphoria of ignorance, I believed that now that there was this law for universal primary education, I must deliver on it. So I went off to one of the remote villages to talk to the village headman about building a girls school which ADB was going to finance. And of course I felt so good about myself and so bloated about myself that I'm doing something good. I thought I'll be welcomed by this village headman with garlands and all that. Over dinner, when I talked about this project, he said, so you want to encourage girls education? I said, yes, I will do the same. He said, good, I strongly support you. Uh, so what we really need is a rural water supply. And I said, just a minute, I'm not here for a rural water supply project. I'm here for a girl's education. I was in the girl's education. And he said, yeah, I understand. You know, we, we first want a rural water supply and I still didn't get it. An hour later, I got the difference between Niti and Nai. Niti was that there is an universal law saying girls must go to school. Nai is that that girl child in that village walks seven hours a day up and down to fetch a pail of water. And the Nai would be served if I provided a rural water supply connection at her village so that she would not spend seven hours but seven minutes and then go to school. And that was an epiphany for me. And I want this to be an important element of what you take away from this is Niti is very important. I'm not at all talking against it. But what I'm saying is it's much more, inclusive growth is much more than Niti. So governance is much more than just having the rules of law. Governance is actually about implementing. You can have the police 
But if the people are afraid to go to the police for good reasons, then there is no nai. So, I want to introduce some other Sanskrit. This is a bit more complicated, so you don't have to write it down. Uh, it's called Matsanyai. Matsa means fish. Matsanyai means justice in the world of the fish. And do you know what the justice is in the world of fish? Justice in the world of fish is very simple. The big fish eat up the small fish. That's justice in the world of fish. And what we want to avoid is a social order which avoids matsanyai. We have to have inclusive growth which includes the empowered at the bottom of the pyramid, which has nyai but not matsanyai. And therefore, the whole question of justice, of human rights, of empowerment comes in because as Professor Sain has said, and only he can say it in as articulate a way that he does, and I'm quoting him now in his book, Development as Freedom. He says, the greatest relevance of ideas of justice lies in the identification of patent injustice on which reasoned agreement is possible rather than in the de derivation of some extant formula for how the world should be precisely run. Now, to me, that's extremely powerful and relevant. We can spend all the time talking about what that particular law, the particular clause has to be. And in this rank ordering, which is more important, but all of us can agree very quickly that the girl infanticide is unacceptable, period. You don't have to worry too much about other things. Now, if that partial rank ordering of which on which we can all agree, and we can have near it, we can have less than perfect, maybe, but certainly much better state of justice, social justice, and therefore. So obviously, we're talking about the reduction of the patent injustices, gross violations of governance, corruption is a part of it. Now, if we have those institutions, good institutions, good governance, easier said than done, but then you can have inclusive growth. Now, my own feeling, my own, own uh, hope is that in Asia, we're seeing a tipping point. Uh, we are seeing this improvement far from being perfect. But we are getting to a point when India and China and many of the other countries are recognizing the importance of NAI. So therefore, it's no coincidence, I think, that the first public address that the new uh, chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping, says is about corruption. And he says how the entire authenticity, the entire credibility of the system could come unstuck, the legitimacy of the system could come unstuck on on corruption. Similarly, in India, where they're debating this very, very robustly. But inclusive growth is obviously a major challenge that Asia faces. The other one, which I think is equally critical, is environmental sustainability. Now, Asia faces many challenges, and you know, I won't go into all of those, and you know them urbanization, demographics, financial sector, but I'm just sort of taking that big 30,000, big picture from 30,000 feet, inclusive growth and green growth. That is what we need. Now, I think for decades, the world has taken a view, certainly Asia has taken the view that you can grow now and clean up later. Just cannot be done. I think, and Canada is probably a good example which shows that you have to grow and clean and clean and grow at the same time. Uh, over the past four decades in Asia, we have made a mess of our environment. Uh, we are now the world's largest greenhouse gas, or China is the world's largest greenhouse gas emitter. China has lost about 70% of its mangrove forests. Air pollution in major Asian cities is associated with more than half a million deaths every year. Uh, one can go on and on. Uh, and, and the environmental situation is very dire. Now, quite understandably, uh, people in Asia feel that it's not our fault. That it's the West actually which caused the problem in the first place. They are the ones who have grown for the last 200 years. They are the ones who produce the greenhouse gas emissions. Look at what the Americans have done. Their per capita consumption is you know, 40 times higher than us, poor us in India or China. Look at the number of cars they have in the garage and I'm here on a bike, etc. You know the story. Uh, and I think all of them is true. 
out of chemistry. And therefore, it, it brings into an issue in which I think Asia has to show leadership and statesmanship, in which we will have to move away from this per capita argument, appealing as it is to an absolute number, because the environment unfortunately recognizes only one planet and does not recognize the boundaries within it. And if that is the case, then I think Asia will have to show leadership and talk about per capita consumption as not being as relevant as the absolute amount of uh, pollution that we're producing. Let me give you some very interesting uh, figures. Uh, we did some study and uh, a couple of years, uh, last year actually, a couple of years back with the University of Cambridge and we said, uh, look, suppose nobody does anything. Everybody presumes, assumes that the world is going to be fine. We can continue with our three cars and consumption lifestyle as is. Uh, by 2100, uh, the average global temperature will rise by 4.9 degrees. Okay, now, give or take a point, doesn't really matter. It's going to be very, very hot and we're going to get cooked. I think we as a human species are going to be extremely uh, vulnerable. And then we said, suppose only the developed countries take action as they're committed under the annex, the annex one countries uh, as they're committed under the Kyoto Protocol, which basically says that they'll reduce their emissions by 80% from 1990 levels by 2050. Now, I personally think with great disappointment that the Annex One countries will not do it. And I'm very disappointed that my own country, Canada, is not doing it. Uh, and our neighbor to the south don't even think there is a problem. So we have a huge problem just on that score. But if they did, which is a big if and a very heroic if, that average temperature, instead of being 4.9 degrees, comes down, but surprise of surprises, only to 4.4 degrees. So even if the developed countries did all they said they would, the drop is very little and not enough to forestall a disaster. However, and this is where I think the, the important implication come that if the developing countries, the, the Argentinas and the Brazils and China and India, Indonesia, Korea, the, the global emerging countries, they also reduce their emissions uh, by restraining their emissions to the 2005 levels by 2050. So by 2050, they produce no more emissions than what they did in 2005 and reduce emissions from deforestation by 50% because that's a huge source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions in developing Asia. Then this combination developed and developing is a very powerful significant impact and the global rise could be limited to 2.7 degrees. Now that conclusion was an extremely powerful and I must say extremely unexpected because it basically says as one would expect that we're all in this together. Developed countries must do their bit, but by themselves not enough. Developing countries must do it well. If that happens, then we do have hope. And unfortunately at the moment, uh, when I say this, I'm extremely unpopular and I anger my colleagues on both sides of the border equally. My developed countries friends, when I make this point, and since not be so unkind to me. I'm sure you won't jump on me on this. Uh, they say, what are you talking about? China is the problem. India is the problem. We sort of, you know. And the developing countries say, you have sold out on the environment debate. And I say to them that just remember, under a business as usual, it means nobody does anything. Of the 20 cities which are identified as the most vulnerable based on population at risk, 15 of them are in Asia. And then the only consolation I'll have if I'm drowning with my grandson in 2100 or my great grandson, I can say, I want you to know that it's not my fault. It's the fault of those very profligate Western consumers who did this. And I'm sure the Western grandfather would be able to say to his granddaughter the same thing, excepting all of us would have drowned. 
So the challenge that Asia faces is I think on both inclusiveness and green growth. Now the positive thing, as I said on the inclusiveness, I do see this issue squarely on the table and being recognized and with some degrees being handled on the inclusive side. Similarly on the green growth side, it's not as if Asia, even though they argue against the ag agreements in the Kyoto Protocol negotiation, uh, China and India, for example, are very aggressively pursuing a low carbon development. Uh, China, for example, has now become the world's leading uh, producer of wind uh, power uh, and they've adopted the electric automobile and high-speed rail transport in a very significant way. India uh, installed more than 300 megawatts of solar power last year and 3000 megawatts of wind power. Uh, nearly every country in Asia now has a national climate change policy and they recognize the importance of what they have. But I think the challenge for the world, not just for Asia, is how to make energy use more efficient and more green. If you tell an Asian that the only way out of this green trouble is no growth, you're not going to get anywhere because you need the growth. I talked to you about the poverty levels. I talked to you about the deprivations. I talked about the 15 to 20 million people entering the labor force every year. So you need growth, but it's a question of what sort of a growth. And therefore, green growth, clean technology, the sort of technology which I know is being developed in Saskatchewan, has a great potential uh, out there. So, yes, you have to burn coal because I don't think you have a choice. I mean, we can say all we want. The bottom line is coal is still much cheaper than the nearest or the next available uh, fuel source. But it does not and it must not be dirty coal. It must be using the supercritical technology, the clean technology which is available. And we've got to find a way of making this technology available at a scale and at costs which are affordable. Uh, and of course, as the scale goes up, the cost will come down, so it will become possible. While Asia sort of wrestles with these two large points, the challenge basically is can they make it? And if they can, of course, the Asian century, $40,000 per capita, 3 million people out of poverty, that golden era will, will, will uh, arrive. And if they don't, is the middle income trap scenario per capita incomes half of what it would be otherwise, only 32% of the global GDP, 3 billion people still stuck in poverty. My feeling, and it's not because I live there, my feeling is that Asia is up to that challenge. The challenges are obviously very myriad and complex, but all evidence points to Asia somehow making it. Uh, I'm not a betting person, so I won't take odds on that, but I would say that our assessment is that Asia will be able to get over these humps, uh, more or less, and gravitate more towards the first rather than the second. Therefore, our thesis is that, yes, the economic center of gravity is indeed shifting eastwards to Asia. And this has huge implication for, for the West, for, for Canada. And I must say that I find it sometimes a bit puzzling that the West, including in Canada, look at this scenario with some trepidation or fear. Totally on the contrary, I believe that it should be seen as a tremendous opportunity because Canada, and again, let me specifically talk about Canada and Saskatchewan, you will never have the market of your own. But there is a market just across the ocean, huge market. Canada, I was mentioning to somebody yesterday night, is both an Atlantic and a Pacific country. Why should we not take advantage of that other heritage which is just as real? USA as Canada's market is very important, should remain important, but we have to diversify. Diversify where? Across the pond. And if that pond gets, not the pond, pond won't get bigger, but if beyond that pond gets bigger and wealthier, it's good for us. 
and there are natural comparative advantages, not just of natural resources, not just of grain or potash or uranium, which is all very important, but further down the chain, up the chain, the value added, the technology, green technology is going to have to be the highest priority for Asia and Canada, because I think that's what we have to offer. So I foresee a 2050 and uh, the good thing about making long-term forecasts is that you probably won't be there to be held accountable. Uh, but, uh, but it's still good to, to make them. Uh, I believe that the Asian century scenario, first of all, must be renamed as the global century. I don't believe, and I'm not saying it just because it's politically correct and all that. I don't believe there's anything going to be called an Asian century. It's either going to be all of us or it's going to be none of us. And I think in that all of us, yes, Asia will heavily influence the future of the world for reasons I've mentioned. But it will be a regional, global compact and a partnership rather than a zero-sum game. And I think that century will be truly our century where you will see cleaner future for us and our children and grandchildren and improvement in welfare for all in Asia and elsewhere. Thank you very much.